in these moments that we have left in our hour of power, I would that you join in with me in preparation to receive what God would speak on this day as we hear what God has spoken in ages past. Would you turn with me in your Bibles or on your smart devices or heed the word of God on the screen from Judges chapter 6, the Old Testament, the Hebrew Bible, the first covenant, the seventh book of that Bible, Judges chapter 6. I want to begin reading in verse number 11 out of the New King James Version of the Bible, asking that if you're physically able, you stand with us and together we reverence the reading of God's word from Judges chapter 6. Now the angel of the Lord came and sat under the terebinth tree, which was in Oprah, which belonged to Joash the Abyssalite, while his son Gideon threshed wheat in the winepress in order to hide it from the Midianites. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him and said to him, The Lord is with you, you mighty man of valor. Gideon said to him, O oh my Lord, if the Lord is with us, why then has all this happened to us? And where are all his miracles which our fathers told us about, saying, Did not the Lord bring us up from Egypt? But now the Lord has forsaken us and delivered us into the hand of the Midianites. The Lord turned to him and said, Go in this might of yours, and you shall save Israel from the hand of the Midianites. Have I not sent you? So Gideon said to him, O my Lord, how can I save Israel? Indeed, my clan is the weakest in Manasseh, and I am the least in my father's house. And the Lord said to him, Surely I will be with you, and you shall defeat the Midianites as one man. Hang out in verse number 13, where Dr. Valerie Bridgman argues is the most real, relevant, and profound question that people who walk with God have to ask. Gideon says, If the Lord is with us, why has all this happened to us, and where are all his miracles? Do me a favor, share with your neighbor the sermon title. Tell him, neighbor, neighbor. oh neighbor, neighbor. Where, is where is God? You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. Although the book of Judges is a book filled with the history of the conquest, the battles of the children of Israel as they take over Canaan and transform it into Israel, it really is one of the most boring books of the Bible. And the reason it's boring is because it's so predictable. And the reason it's so predictable is because chapter after chapter, the book of Judges simply tells the same story over and over and over again. It's a simple story that's outlined for us in chapter 2. When you go home and read, beginning in verse number 11, Natasha, you'll find out that, that it's a story that goes a little something like this. These children of Israel, whom the Lord has brought into the promised land, have made a promise to worship only God. But they disobey God, and they run after idols and begin worshiping false gods. The second phase of the story is that God sees it and God gets angry. And God allows, thirdly, an enemy to come in and take over Israel. The people cry out to God for deliverance. God raises up a judge, a warrior, a leader like Othiniel and Ehud and Samson and Gideon and Deborah. Because you know God uses women and men. And the judge leads them in deliverance. When the judge dies, the story starts all over again. They disobey God. God gets angry. An enemy comes in. They cry out for deliverance. God raises up a judge who delivers them from the hand of the enemy. The judge dies. They go back to worshiping idol gods. God gets angry. They cry out for deliverance. God raises up a judge. A judge brings victory. The judge dies. They'll go back to worshiping idol gods. God gets angry. God's enemy comes in. They cry out for deliverance. God raises up a judge. The judge brings victory. Can you keep up with me? The judge dies. And the story just plays itself over and over and over again. When you get to the sixth chapter, 
The same old story is being told for the fifth time. The children of Israel have disobeyed God and began to worship the idol god Baal. And as a result, God's anger is aroused. God loosens his hand and the Midianites come into Israel. The Midianites occupy Israel for seven years. And every year at harvest, they would come into the land, they would steal the harvest, the agriculture, and the produce, and leave Israel impoverished. Israel is suffering under the hand of the Midianites. There's no food, there's no prosperity, there's no wealth in the land. And so in chapter 6, verse 7, they do what people do. They cry out to God. And they ask God to make a way. And God does what God always does when God's people ask for deliverance. God shows up and says, I'm going to bring you out. In order to do it, God's got to raise up a judge, a leader, a warrior. And this one's name is Gideon. Gideon is the son of Joash. And when the Lord seeks Gideon out, he finds out Gideon is not in church. Gideon is not in the synagogue. Gideon ain't at prayer meeting. Gideon is not at choir rehearsal. Gideon is not in Bible study. No, God finds Gideon thrashing wheat in the wine press. You don't thrash wheat in the wine press. You make wine in the wine press. So what you ought to be asking is why is Gideon thrashing wheat in the wine press? Here it is, because he's afraid of the Midianites. And he knows that the Midianites see him with a harvest, they will take the harvest and maybe kill him. So Gideon is hiding out in the wine press. My, my trust ain't got it yet. Um, he's, he's hiding out in the wine press. Jeff, he's, he's at the ABC store. <laughs> Nudge your neighbor asking, what's that? What's that? <laughs> he, he's at the ABC store hiding out from the enemy. And it is there that God calls and commissions him. God calls him by sending an angel, and the angel comes, and the angel has two messages from God both of which are problematic. The angel shows up, and this is what the angel says. Gideon, number one, the Lord is with you. And number two, you are a mighty man of valor. Now, now there are two problems with this. The first is the term mighty man of valor. The term mighty man of valor in Hebrew is really two words. It's Gabor Hayil. Everyone say Gabor. Ha'il, you're learning Hebrew. Gabor Ha'il is really problematic because, Sister Georgia, it, it, it really is redundant because Gabor and Ha'il can be translated the same way. Say it with me. The angel shows up and says, Gabor Ha'il. Gabor means mighty warrior. Ha'il is translated mighty warrior. So although your English compresses it into one in Hebrew, this is what the angel says. Gideon, mighty man of valor, mighty man of valor. He says it twice over Gideon's life. Now the reason that ought to mess you up is I just told you what Gideon was doing. Gideon was hiding out at the liquor store from the Midianites and God shows up and calls him a mighty man of valor. Somebody, you missed an easy amen right there that when God sees us and God calls us and God creates opportunity, it is not based upon who we are, but what God sees we can be. I wish I had a shout right here that God sees in you more than you see in yourself, more than others see in you, that God calls us based on what God knows we can be. You know, in a real sense, you look better in God's eyes than you really look. Okay, okay all right. Stephen A. got me. Um, um, I, I, I'm on 
I don't really don't like social media. I'm going to tell you that. I really don't like social media. Um, I, I think it's a platform for immaturity. And I'm too grown to live my life uh, on, on Instagram and Twitter. But I got on Snapchat because um, I got a teenage son. And Dean Clark, I got to keep up with what he's doing. So I'm on Snap. I don't snap. <laughs> but I watch what's going on. And uh, I found out on Snapchat, some of you all know this, they have these things called filters. Um, and you, if, you don't, if, you, if you're over 50, I'm going to help you. Um, a filter allows you to take a picture of how you really look, and then you can edit it with some things uh, that make you look a little better than you really look. Uh, you can smooth out some wrinkles. Uh, you can put some color in your eye. Uh, you can put some freckles on your face, because you know freckles are just beautiful on, on, on people, hey, amen. That, that, uh, you, you can put a crown on your head, you can put stars all around you, and by the time you finish with the filter, your filter picture looks a whole lot better than you look in real life. Let me tell you how God sees you. That when God sees you, God knows how rusty, dusty, crusty your life really looks. But God has a way of putting some filter on you and you look so much better in God's eyes than you really look. Is there anybody here that knows that God opened some doors that you with yourself had no business looking in, but God saw you better than you saw yourself? Would you know somebody tell them, I look good in God's eyes? So God, God puts a filter on Gideon and calls him mighty man of valor. But the second problem with the angel says is deep. The angel says, God is with you. Gideon looks around at everything going wrong, and he asks two questions. So if God is with me, number one, why is all this happening? And number two, where are his miracles? Stay with me. He doesn't doubt if God is real. He doesn't even doubt that God is with him. What he wants is some proof. And for him, the presence of God is contradicted by two things. What he's going through and what God seemingly is not doing. Y'all, I don't care how big your Bible is, how loud your shout is, how many Sundays you consecutively attend church, you can know the third verse of since Jesus came into my life. But life has a way of putting people of faith in a place where if the truth is, you don't doubt that God is real. You know there's a God in heaven. You don't even wonder if God is by your side. But what you want to know is this. If God is with me, why is all this happening? If God is with me, why did the doctor say cancer? If God is with me, why did I get laid off? If God is with me, why did he break my heart? And not only that, but if God is with me, where are all his miracles? In that question is the assumption that if God is with me, God ought to be doing some stuff. My prayers ought to be answered. Some doors ought to be opened. Some ways ought to be made. Some blessings ought to be delivered. Have you ever been in a place, look, listen, I know you can't wave a hand because it's Sunday and you got on your Baptist beautiful and your neighbor thinks you're Holy Ghost filled. But have you ever been in a place where you wondered if God is with me, why is all this happening? Have you ever said, if God is with me, Lord, surely you ought to be doing something, ought to be some ways made, some prayers answered, some miracles delivered, some del God, you ought to be doing something. How can this be happening and God do nothing? And what God shows to Gideon in this passage that I want to reveal to you is that the presence of God in your life is not limited by God giving you the things you want. God's presence is not limited to getting a yes to every prayer you pray. As a matter of fact, God's miracles are not limited to the stuff you shout about in church. 
God shows Gideon, I am with you in three fundamental ways that I want to press on you this morning because somebody came to church and you're wondering, how could God let this happen? And why is God not doing what I think God should be doing? And I want to tell you that God is yet with you in three undeniable ways. Can I give them to you in 16 minutes and we go on to brunch? Well, y'all will. I got to stay for 1130. Uh, Three ways you know God is with you. Number one, you know God is with you in the wrath God has withheld from you. You know God's hand is on you, watch this, because what should have happened didn't happen. Don't, don't worry. <laughs> don't worry. I'm going to earn you, amen. I'm going to earn it. I'm going to earn it. Um, Gideon's wondering, Lord, where are you? What Gideon failed to remember is how Israel wound up with Midianite oppression. The reason they were oppressed is because Israel continuously, constantly, and even creatively found ways to disobey God. And when you go home and you reread Judges, you're going to find in chapter 1, verse 11, chapter 2, verse 7, chapter 2, verse 12, chapter 4, verse 1, chapter 6, verse 1, Pastor Reed's Bible, uh, is the same phrase. And Israel did evil again in the sight of the Lord. Chapter 1, Israel did evil again in the sight of the Lord. Chapter 2, Israel did evil again in the sight of the Lord. Chapter 4, Israel did evil again in the sight of the Lord. Chapter 6, Israel did evil again in the sight of the Lord. Now, let me tell you something. Israel better be glad I ain't God. Because if you have done evil in my sight that many times, I am through with you. You do know that everyone in your life has a limit with you. You mess up a few times, but even the one who loves you has a limit with how much of you they gonna put up with. Okay, you ain't got like that. You have a limit with some folk in your life. Have you ever had a joker cross the limit and you had to cut them off, block their number, erase them from Facebook, give them the scripture, now may the Lord watch. Between me and thee, while we are absent, one from another. Don't call me. Don't look for me. If you see me, cross the street. Walk on the other side. If I come to 9.30, you come to 11.30. I... Have you ever had enough of somebody? If I was God, right about now, I would have had enough of Israel. Y'all continuously do the wrong thing. But God is so merciful. And God is so loving. And God is so forgiving that even when Israel continued to do wrong, God never abandoned them. That's why in Hebrew, one of the most powerful phrases to describe God is this Hebrew word, hesed. Let the church say hesed. hesed. No, Judy, they said it like you're, you're American. Um, you've got you've to say it uh, like you've got some uh, Hebrew in you. Uh, it's hesed. It, 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 you you got to get a little spit in your throat. And that, Judy, that's how you hesed. Try it again, hesed. That, that, that's right. And let me tell you what Hesed, it, it, a good way to understand Hesed, the Bible translated it as merciful or faithful. But here's what it really means. It, it, it means God gets God's hands dirty with us and God refuses to wash his hands. The best way to understand your God is that God doesn't mind getting God's hands dirty when God deals with us. And yet God never washes his hands of us because no matter how dirty we get, God never takes God's hand off of your life. Oh, wait, that's a good place to wave an amen because as rotten as you've been, as wretched as you've been, as low down as you've been, God has never 
taking his hand off of you. Now, now let me tell you why three people on your road didn't even smile. Because so often we want to act like we're not sinners. I know you got a Bible and I know you're in church on Sunday. But allow me to tell you, you are still a sinner. And if I know you like I know me, I'm willing to bet that your sin resume is a whole lot longer than your righteous resume. That every day we add to our resume of sin. And this is how you know God is still with you. That God did not allow you to reap the full consequence of your sin. Because understand this, I want to see who catches this. When you were saved and you gave your life to the Lord, when you said yes to Jesus, you were not simply saved from the fires of hell when you die. You've been saved from the wrath of God while you live. That the salvation of God doesn't just kick in when the undertaker gets you. The salvation of God kicks in the here and now so that even though I sin, the full wrath of God never consumes my life as it ought to. And I ought to know that God is with me, not by what God gave me, but rather by what God did not allow to happen to me. Now, let me tell you why that's a hard amen. How can I shout over what God didn't allow to happen because I really don't know what God didn't allow to happen? You, you with me? How do I know what I don't know? If God didn't allow it to happen, I didn't know that it could happen because God kept it from happening, which means I'm totally ignorant of what could have happened but didn't go down. So how can I shout over what I didn't know? You never really know everything God kept from you. So how can I praise God for what I don't know? Here it is. Let me help you. Um, you don't know what God didn't allow to happen, but you do know how many times you fell short. You do know that you go to bed every night as a sinner. You do know that you messed up today, and when you lay down tonight, you've added to your sin resume. You know you are a sinner. And here's how you know God is still in your life. Because even though you laid down in sin, on the next morning, when you started to stir in your bed, and you didn't even know what day it was, and had to look at the clock to see what time it was, when you opened your eyes, you experienced the miracle of God because God did not kill you while you slept. I wish I had somebody here who didn't take waking up for granted, but know that I woke up because God is a good God and he's a miracle working God. I'm, I'm, I'm talking about experiencing the miracle of God early in the morning. Five, 5.46 in the morning. Crack of dawning while you're yawning. Wiping the cold out your eye. See who's... Y'all in... Where am I 40 and under? Y'all y'all, 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 know what that's from. See who's this? That, that's when you wake up and you realize that I should have died last night. That God would have been justified in taking me out of here. But morning by morning, brand new mercies, God delivers to me. And I'm grateful to be alive this morning. How dare you doubt if God is with you when yourself woke up this morning? You know God is with you by the wrath God has withheld. Ooh, but I'm about to test your amen. You know how you know God is with you, number two? By the assistance 
God has assigned to you. Here's, here's where you miss the presence of God. God has a way of sending people into your life to help you get through the season that you're going through. Oh, God, God knows how to partner you with the right folk. Yeah, yeah, you need to read your Bible. When, when Paul was struggling, God assigned Barnabas to encourage him. When God knew Mary would doubt her pregnancy, God assigned Elizabeth to show up in her life. When Moses needed help getting a word to Pharaoh, God assigned Aaron to translate for him. When Gideon needed some help, God assigned 300 soldiers to stand by his side. When God sent me to Alfred Street and I needed some help, God assigned Judy Fentress Williams to stand by my side and help me with the work I've got to do because God knows. Listen, have you ever had the right person show up at the right time to do the right thing for the right reason with the right word and it brought the right result and you can look back and know that had to be the hand of God. I, I know. I know you'd rather shout over a new Benz or a promotion on your job, but I'm looking for somebody that can thank God for the people that God sent to help you in the midst of your struggle. Is there anybody you can thank God for? Thank God for my best friend. Thank God for my deacon. Thank God for my pastor. Thank God. Who in your life has been sent by God? You know that person that keep on calling even when you don't call back. You know that one that showed up just to give you a word of encouragement. The one who prayed for you when you didn't even ask him to pray. The one who put a 20 in your hand when you, hallelujah, when you was in college. The Lord has a way of showing up through the presence of other people. And your homework assignment tonight is to identify the folk that you know the Lord has sent into your life and just tell them thank you. I thank God for you. You were the right person at the right time who showed up in the right way for the right reason to do the right thing that brought me the right results and I know God was using you. We miss God because we don't appreciate the wrath that God has withheld. We miss God because we don't appreciate the people God has placed in our lives. But let me give you the third way you know God is still with you, the wrath he's withheld, the assistance he's assigned, but watch the third one, the promises he's going to perform. I want you to read the Bible. Watch how this goes. Gideon says, if the Lord is with us, why is all this happening and where are his miracles? God shows up and says, Gideon, go to battle. I promise you'll win and you'll know I'm with you. Okay, you miss it. Gideon wants to know, where's the Lord right now? God says, go to battle. I promise you, you'll win, and you'll know I'm with you. Okay, say third time strong. Uh, God, where are you? Go fight, boy. I promise you, you'll win, and you'll know I'm with you. Gideon is searching for God's presence, and God affirms it through his promise. What God says is, listen, my presence is in my promise. So when you walk in my promise and the promise is fulfilled, then my presence is verified. That the way you know I'm still with you is the fact that I'm doing what I said I was going to do in my word. 
that if you want to know I'm with you, watch how all things work together for your good. If you want to know I'm with you, watch how no weapon formed against you shall prosper. You want to know I'm with you, watch how I take weeping in the night and turn it to joy in the morning. You want to know I'm with you, watch how I take what was meant for evil and work it together for your good. So when his promise is fulfilled, his presence ought to be verified. Uh, let, let me shut it down. We're a little bit late. We got to get on out of here. Um, I found this out speaking with a brother in church a little while ago. And well, you know that in interacting with him, I found out that God has a name that we don't always associate with God, but it's God. Let, let me teach you. Let me teach you. I know you know Jehovah, Shalom, Jehovah, Nisi, Jehovah, Jireh. You may know El Shaddai, Adonai, Elohim. You may know all those names. Can I teach you another name of God? Is it all right if you learn another name? Um, it came to me while talking to a brother. And while speaking with the brother out in the hallway, right out there in the narthex, he began sharing with me how rough life had gotten for him. His finances were fragile. His spouse was sick. His child was cutting up. He said, Reverend, you know, it's just, just a rough season. Money, money's not right. My wife is struggling. And my child's acting up. He said, I've been praying and God isn't really answering. Money's not coming. Health ain't no better. Child didn't turn around. I made him a promise that I'd pray for him. Saw him a little bit later and asked him how things were going. He said, well, Reverend, the Lord still hadn't answered. Money's still rough, spouse still sick, child still cutting up. He said, but somehow we're making it. Somehow the bills are getting paid. Somehow he ain't got kicked out of school. Somehow she's still stabilized. Somehow I haven't gone crazy. Somehow we haven't lost everything. Somehow we're just making it by. If you ain't caught it yet, I come by to teach you another name for God. God isn't just El Shaddai and Jehovah this and Jehovah that, but God is by somehow. Somehow is God. Somehow I made it, that's God. Somehow I got through, that's God. Somehow we stuck together, that's God. Would you slap five with your neighbor? and tell them God is my somehow. Where is God? He's in the wrath he withheld. Where is God? In the people he's placed. And where is God? In my somehow. Because when his promise is fulfilled, his presence is verified. Come on, stand on your feet. I want you to know this. Somehow, means I may not know how, but I know who. I really don't know how we made it through July, but I know who got us through. I don't know how we made it thus far, but I know who brought us through. God is my somehow. And maybe you came to church today wondering like Gideon, where is God? everything going on and going wrong, prayers not being answered. And God wants you to know I'm in your life by the fact that you're still living in spite of how low you've fallen, how many sins you've committed. I'm in your life because there's some people who I've assigned to you that are helping you through this season of life. And I'm with you because I am your somehow. When you don't understand how you made it from day to day, there's but one answer. God and God says since I have not let go of you please don't let go of me for someone today that means that you need to open your heart to a God who's been merciful to you before you accepted him at Alpha Street we've said before that God's hand was on your heart before you put your heart in God's hand that God didn't just show up today in your life God has been with you in every sinful season you've come through. And God wants to reign over your life.